Good afternoon. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. and Dr. Kreuz, who are going to be uh, giving this afternoon's lecture on professionalism and medicine social contract with society. So I'm going to introduce both because they both have really impressive credentials. Uh, so Dr. Richard Kreuz is a professor of orthopedic surgery and a member of the Center for Medical Education at McGill University. He served as chair of orthopedics from 1976 to 1981 directing a basic science lab and publishing extensively in the field. He was dean of the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University from 1981 to 1995, during which time they started issues of cutting back on residents and the whole issue of work hours. If you stay late, we might be able to ask him some more questions. He was the president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association, the American Orthopedic Research Society, the Association of Canadian Medical Colleges, and he is an officer of the Order of Canada and of L'Ordre National de Quebec. And it would really not be Laney introducing him if I didn't mention that he is Princeton class of 1951. <laughs> Dr. Sylvia Croix is an endocrinologist, professor of medicine, and also a member of the Center for Medical Education at McGill University. Dr. Croix has served as director of the Metabolic Day Center from 1968 to 1978 and medical director of the Royal Victoria Hospital from 1978 to 1995 in Montreal. She was a member of the Deschamps uh, Commission on the Conduct of Research on Humans and Establishments, and she also holds the position of Officer of the Order of Canada. Together, they have taught and conducted independent research on professionalism in health professions and medicine social contract with society since 1995. They continue to travel internationally speaking on this topic at universities, hospitals, and professional organizations. McGill University has established the Richard and Sylvia Croix Chair in Medical Education. And I actually bought their book, which I've used <laughs> with a course recently. Um, it was co-authored with one of their colleagues, Yvonne Steinert, and it's called Teaching Medical Professionalism, and I recommend it highly. On that note, I'm going to turn it over to the Croixes. Thank you very much for coming to visit us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it really is wonderful to be here. Uh, we are so impressed with the series on professionalism that you're giving. It, it, we're just so pleased to be a part of it. It is, includes virtually everybody who's contributed to our current understanding of, of the field. We're old enough, so we actually took Latin uh, <laughs> several years. And uh, Crescat Scientia Vita Ex Colatur, uh, is translated by your scholars uh, in a very <laughs> awkward way. It says, let knowledge grow from more to more and so be human life enriched. Now, uh, we quote Osler a lot, and that's sort of late 19th, early 20th century uh, rhetoric, I think. <laughs> we consulted one of our uh, Latin scholars at Miguel from the Classics Department, and he suggested that let knowledge grow that life may be enriched. It was a little simpler and a little more <laughs> contemporary. Uh, we actually think this is so appropriate for your series on professionalism. Uh, professionalism is, is very important to society and I think you're contributing actually to the dis dissemination of knowledge around it and uh, that society will be better if people understand in some way the relationship of medicine to society. We're going to talk about professionalism and medicine social contract. Uh, we understand, uh, we're a little intimidated because there's some philosophers around here and, uh, who probably understand social contract theory better than we do. Um, and they will know that social contract theory uh, uh, is not immediately applicable. It suggests that, the th that social contract is not immediately applicable to contemporary society. Uh, and we've had a discourse with other people on this. We've got to have some means of framing our discourse with society. By our, I mean medicines. And uh, social contract uh, theory has a history. It is uh, understood by many, many people. We and it. Oh, as we'll see later on, it is part of that discourse. So uh, with a, a caveat that we understand there's some limitations to using social contract to describe our relationship, we will start. So. Uh, why professionalism, why now, and why the social contract? We thought we'd start with a few vignettes, uh, just to sort of describe the situations. You are a patient in the emergency room with chest pain. You have a personal cardiologist who has, been treat who you who has treated you for a heart attack in the past. 
you ask that he be called in the, and be informed that he is unavailable as he is about to go to a basketball game. Second vignette, and I'm sure this will relate to many of you in practice, a long-standing patient of yours has developed a life-threatening condition whose optimal treatment is not covered under his health care plan. You are asked to endorse his insurance claim using a diagnosis for which the specific treatment is covered. So, where are we right now? Well, society is better informed than it ever was. It's asking for accountability, transparency, and a sound professional standards. And we, in medicine, feel that our autonomy is severely restricted by budgets, by bureaucracy, by guidelines, and by peer review. The result is actually that our relationship with society is under very intense scrutiny. Most call this a social contract, which is a term going back 300 years, as Dick said. In medicine, the concept is frequently talked to you, hear it talked about, you read about it. It's rarely analyzed. And it really, most doesn't, don't understand that there are reciprocal rights and obligations that are really what, is, what the concept is all about. So what's a social contract? Uh, 18th century concept, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, straight line back to them, uh, uh, philosophers, political scientists who have used it. Uh, the concept obviously has evolved over time. Uh, it was uh, originally uh, developed to try and describe the relationship when there were uh, hereditary monarchies and citizens had very few rights. It's still used to describe the organization of contemporary society and medicine. Rawls did not classify health care as a primary social good, uh, but he certainly in, uh, referred to health care frequently in his, in his works uh, and said that, they were that health care was necessary for citizens to enjoy all of the benefits of contemporary life. And Norman Daniels, of course, is a, is a contractualist, as is William Sullivan, and they both approach health care within the context of a social contract. So we aren't just an orthopedic surgeon and an endocrinologist who are, <laughs> who are invoking this concept. It stresses, as Sylvia said, mutual privileges and obligations, and we think that this is important. Uh, we use a definition from Guff, who published this in 1957, that the rights and duties of the state and its citizens are reciprocal, and the recognition of this reciprocity constitutes a relationship by which, analog which by analogy can be called a social contract. By analogy. It's not a written contract. And uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy has something which is quite similar, actually. The social contract in healthcare. This is cited frequently in the literature by physicians, healthcare planners, and non-physicians. Uh, that the social contract in healthcare hinges on professionalism, that the, uh, it is the basis for the expectations of both medicine and society. It isn't constant, it's constantly being renegotiated as medicine and society evolve. Uh, in our lifetime, uh, the social contract in healthcare and the nature of professionalism have changed dramatically. Uh, professionalism has got to evolve uh, as the contract changes. So where did we start? Well, we started with what Fred Hafferty, who is a wonderful sociologist, calls nostalgic professionalism. At that time, most physicians were, and surgeons were solo practitioners. Uh, they were accountable only to the patient, very little to society. The patient paid them directly, and there was sort of a, what has been called a covenant between the patient and the, and, uh, the physician. Now, at that time, we had unquestioned authority and autonomy. Uh, it sometimes was a little frightening when we first went into practice that you would tell a patient to do something, and they did. Uh, and uh, there were lots of opportunities to demonstrate altruism using the Robin Hood principle of asking the rich to pay a little bit more and serving those who couldn't pay uh, without cost. And physicians and surgeons were highly uh, trusted. The reason we start there is because that's a lot of what we believe today, both society and individual physicians. This is what people think uh, is what practice is all about. But a lot has changed since that time. First, 
healthcare is much more effective than it used to be. It's much more complex, and therefore it costs a lot more. Uh, the result is there is a high financial risk, and most people can't pay directly for the care they get. And third party payers who've come in, whether it's the state, as it is somewhat north of you, uh, or the corporate sector, the insurance companies and the HMOs, this has changed the contract. But society also changed. Starting somewhere in about the 60s was the questioning society. Uh, they questioned why they gave trust to our profession uh, blindly and thought that we better get down and earn it. They looked at our altruism, thought well, we paid more attention to our own finances and, and to our own uh, self-interest. And they said that we allowed incompetent, uh, unethical people to continue in practice without doing anything about it, mainly that we did not self-regulate well. We also, along with this, had new levels of accountability. It was no longer just to the patient. It was to the payers and also to society, and this changed the contract too. Now, there are tensions in the contract in this relationship with society. In the first place, is the practice of medicine a job, or is it more than that? Is it a calling? And I think most people, even the Marxists, agree that it is more than just a job. The problem of altruism versus self-interest, we all, uh, that is a very hard line to draw between what I get pleasure out of and being altruistic and what I can do for the patient. Art versus science and technology. We are increasingly surrounded by science and wonderful developments in technology. Where's the art of medicine gone? Uh, sometimes this is partly humanism. And autonomy versus accountability. The more accountable you are, the less autonomy you really have. Um, now there are new ones. The question of whether the practice of medicine is a moral act or whether it's something to be sold. And I think that you have much more of that down here than we do, but it is a, whether it's a commodity. What is our duty to our patients, the fiduciary duty, versus our responsibility to society in a place with limited resources? Uh, not everybody can get at everything, and who's responsible for that? Uh, collegiality versus competition. Uh, the more competitive you are, the less collegial you are. The less collegial you are, the harder it is to self-regulate. And the less self-regulate is done because you're competing with somebody. And there's also the employee. Many are now employees of, of some company or whatever versus the independent professional and nostalgic professionalism. So our, if you look at those tensions and, and clump them, uh, and we're sort of clumpers, uh, our threats come from two sources. The first are internal. Within our areas of jurisdiction, uh, w things that we must do and which in, in some areas which we have failed to do. The others, of course, come from outside. The na generally the nature of the healthcare system within which we must function, within which the people we are trying attempting to help learn must function. And those, we see no alternative to some form of negotiation to try and alter that. Uh, so that will be a theme uh, throughout this. Uh, professional status is important to us. Uh, and uh, certainly the sociologists, uh, uh, if you read uh, most of them, you will, uh, I think it, it won't do much for your ego, but I think they're absolutely <laughs> correct. They, they point out that, they, that it confers prestige and respect. Everybody wants their child to become a professional. Uh, it, we are generally trusted. Uh, we have autonomy in practice, less than we used to, but it's still there. We do enjoy the privilege of self-regulation. And of course, there are substantial financial rewards. So it's important to us to try and maintain aspects of professionalism. Uh, but I think that in the last 10 to 15 years, outside observers, uh, generally from the social sciences, have concluded that, uh, so, so that professionalism, professions are actually a benefit to society, unlike George Bernard Shaw, who said that professions uh, were a conspiracy against the society. Uh, Elliot Friedson wrote a series of books through the years, and I see you're, uh, that Andrew Abbott is or going to, uh, 
going mm -hmm. to discuss his contributions. It was interesting, he went the, from being highly critical of the medical profession uh, to, uh, in his last two books, he returned to a sense almost of despair, pointing out that professionals were benefit, beneficial to society. And Bill Sullivan, a friend of ours, has stated that neither economic incentives nor technology nor administrative control has proved an effective surrogate for the commitment to integrity evoked in the ideal of professionalism. I think that's probably why we're all here today. Somehow we have to inculcate professionalism in the medical profession so that it comes from within. Because you can't impose those types of standards. Uh, and it's also important, I think, for, to point out to society that we are not just pursuing our own self-interest one and elite status, which we have, as we're trying to defend professionalism. That there are observers in society who feel that the survival of functioning professionalism uh, is important to society. So what is medical professionalism? And we'll just very briefly go through how we have approached it at McGill. Uh, we find it easier to divide the roles that a physician has into two, that of the healer and that of the professional. Now, you don't wake up at eight and become a professional and decide at 11 you're gonna be a healer. You always are combining together. Uh, but we have found that it is much easier to analyze them separately. And the reason we do this is because the history is very different. There have always been healers in society. You know, the, med the medicine men and women, the shamans and so forth have, have always had a role in society and a respected role. The professions arose in the Middle Ages in the guilds and the universities in medieval Europe and England. Uh, the learned professions were the law, clergy, medicine, and the military. Uh, we won't go into why that happened. They uh, served an elite. Uh, they were not very impressive in society. And uh, there was some question, if you think of George III, of why we would ever go to a physician. Uh, you sometimes were worse off than if you just let nature take its course. Until science came along. And science came along at the same time of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution gave people enough money to buy health care. And science, uh, of course, was worth, made it worth buying. Because of science, uh, the linkages to universities became very strong. Uh, and most medical schools are university-based. And most residency programs, all of them in, in Canada, but some of them here, are university-based. And this brings us to the present. Two very strong links between the two are the codes of ethics, which describe the behaviors of both the healer and the professional, and, of course, science, which empowers both. Professionalism, as you read about it, in, as the word is used usually, uh, is both roles. Uh, we have chosen to separate them. Now, uh you can justify this by going to the literature and you can tease out the aspects of uh, professionalism and of the healer. Obviously these things, as Sylvia said, go back generations. Caring and compassion, listening to the patient, insight, openness, uh, respect for the healing function. We actually heal very few people. They heal themselves. We try and facilitate that. Respect for patient dignity and autonomy, advocate for the patient, and the fact that you're there for your patient. Those things are traditionally associated in the literature with the healer. Uh, autonomy, self-regulation, and the presence of associations and institutions that carry out our business for us are characteristic of professions. We weren't, uh, Hippocrates wasn't responsible to society, he was responsible to patients and students. Uh, that's a new concept, and of course teamwork is something that's been added. In the middle are a host of uh, activities which are common to both, Competence, of course, being the outstanding one. Uh, confidentiality, altruism, and a trustworthiness, and a, and a constellation of attributes that, that make you trustworthy. Uh, integrity, honesty, morality, and ethical behavior as expressed in codes of, of ethics, and responsibility to the profession. Now, profession, professionalism are generic terms applied to different occupations in this world. Uh, change this to lawyer, uh, change this to adjudicator of disputes, you change this, but these stay relatively similar. That, that's one of the reasons why we think there's some logic to taking this approach. But, and it's a very big but, 
society doesn't need a lawyer. They need an adjudicator of disputes. Society doesn't need a professional. They need a healer. Professionalism is a means to an end. So uh, we can't remember the definition that we wrote and published, uh, and certainly don't expect anybody else to. When you create, uh, we believe that if you're going to teach and evaluate something in current medical education, you have to be very careful uh, in outlining what you're going to teach. So definitions really are important. Uh, we've traveled a lot, and we, the most common failing uh, amongst, we believe, amongst those people trying to teach professionalism is that they don't agree on a common definition which serves as the basis of teaching and learning and evaluation. This was designed to serve medical educators. Uh, it is all-encompassing, which is why you can't remember it. I'll, I'll read it, but uh, it's certainly available in the literature. It doesn't matter which definition you pick if you're going to teach and evaluate professionalism. There are a half dozen very good ones in the literature. Pick one and use it. This is ours, an occupation whose core element is work based upon the mastery of a complex body of knowledge and skills. It is a vocation in which knowledge of some department of science or the practice of an art founded upon it is used in the service of others. That's straight out of the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, so we didn't make it up. Its members are governed by codes of ethics and profess, that's what we do when we recite the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath, a commitment to competence, integrity and morality, altruism, and the promotion of the public good within their domain. These com commitments form the basis of a social contract between a profession and society, and society in turn grants, uh, we don't have a God-given right to our professional status, the profession a monopoly over the use of its knowledge base, that's our license, uh, the right to uh, considerable autonomy in practice and the privilege of self-regulation. Professions and their members are accountable to those served, to their colleagues, and to society. So that's our concept of what profession consists of. Now, when you look at this, the role of the healer is really universal. You can go around the world and talk to fellow physicians or surgeons and you can relate to them because of the healer role. But the professionalism will vary between countries because of the culture, and their social contract will vary because of the, uh, their cultures and their traditions. So why invoke the social contract? Well, in the first place, we need to communicate with the society, and professionalism is, provides a basis for this dialogue, which we must put. We can no longer not listen to what society is telling us, as we did for about 30 years. Um, it supplies the rationale for our obligations, for our professional obligations that we must do. And it implies consequences if we don't meet them. Uh, others' re reasonable expectations. Uh, Rudolf Klein, who's a sociologist in England, I think gives a very nice uh, definition of today's social contract where he calls it a bargain. He said it's a bargain where we're given prestige, autonomy, the privilege of self-regulation and rewards on the understanding that we'll be altruistic, self-regulate well, be trustworthy, and address the concerns of society. Now, the social contract is not like GM and the auto workers, uh, and it is really a mix of written and unwritten. Uh, the licensing laws, healthcare legislation, codes of ethics, all are written and uh, available to the public. And there are some legal obligations that arise out of this. Uh, but there are moral obligations. You cannot legislate someone to be compassionate. You cannot legislate somebody to have presence. Uh, so that there are moral obligations to this. And there are the ones that are universal, mainly the healer, and those that are local. And as society changes and as medicine changes, it's constantly evolving, being renegotiated, if you will. So who are the parties to the contract? Uh, Klein, you know, you really don't need what we're about to say because we think Rudolf Klein's uh, is lovely and elegant and simple. We're not <laughs> going to goof it all up for you by making it too complex. Uh, the, so the social contract takes place between medicine and society, and neither medicine nor society are monolithic. They both are extraordinarily complex. Uh, medicine, uh, of course, consists of individual physicians, primarily, 
and our institutions that represent us. Those include licensing bodies, professional associations, medical schools, and so forth and so on. And uh, the American Medical Association, of course, is important. The, uh, uh, the stance which we take when we address society de uh, depends on the interaction between us and our institutions, those chosen to represent us. And there's clearly tension uh, at that uh, level. Uh, we are actually in Canada, I think uh, it, it's interesting, uh, 85, 90 percent of, Cana of Canadian physicians are strongly supportive of our, of our health care system. Uh, so when we address our governments, we're in a different situation uh, from those of you who live in this country where you've got a much more complex system and I think there isn't agreement as to where, what direction medicine should take. Society in the developed and democratic world, of course, consists of governments and uh, citizens. Now, within the healthcare field, we start with patients, uh, but there's also the general public. And patients will have wishes and desires which are different from those of the general public. Uh, it includes how much taxes you wish to pay. It includes whether you think that, so you, that expensive treatment should be covered or should not be covered. Uh, but eventually, uh, generally at the time of elections in most countries, uh, some type of stance is taken uh, on to develop a, 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 a consensus. Uh, government consists of politicians and civil servants, and certainly in nationalized systems like the UK and, and Europe and our country, to an increasing degree, managers who are in the field. They all have their own vested interests. They all have their own opinions. Uh, this overall relationship is intensely political. You should know that the most uh, dangerous job in Canada is not a NASCAR racing driver, it's being a Minister of Health in any of the Canadian provinces. Uh, the half-life is very short uh, be, because healthcare has now into the political arena. Uh, so this is a political relationship. Uh, healthcare is either the first or the second issue in every uh, federal and provincial election in Canada. Uh, it's either the economy or healthcare, and of course they're pretty tightly linked. Uh, the importance of professionalism to this is that for us on this side, uh, the rules of the game are outlined by what it means to be a, a professional. As we rene renegotiate our contract, we cannot do it like the United Auto, Auto Workers do. When you look at that uh, diagram, uh, you will see that uh, there are some uh, things that are not there because we believe these we, along with uh, uh, Rosen and Dewar in the UK, believe that these are modifiers of the contract. Uh, the healthcare system, the nature of the healthcare system, it may also be a, an expression of the contract, but it's, it, it's not in there. Uh, regulatory framework is very important. We'll talk a little bit about the UK in a couple of minutes. Uh, that uh, outlines the nature of the contract. The commercial sector has a huge impact in some countries, much less in ours, great here. Other stakeholders, other healthcare professionals, uh, any organized group in society, and of course, finally, the, the media. Uh, the media doesn't just reflect public opinion. The media, particularly in the healthcare field, directs public opinion to a very great degree. So, what are the expectations that we have? And here's where uh, we could put this all on one slide, but it, it, it tends to oversimplify a very complex relationship. So if you start with what do the patients and the public want of us, of medicine? Well, they obviously need the healer. Uh, and they expect that when they go to a physician or surgeon that they're competent. They want to be assured that they are. They want to be able to get the care they need when they need it. Uh, and there are problems on both sides of the border on that. Uh, they want altruistic service where their needs will come before that of the individual physician. They expect that the practitioner will be moral, will have integrity and be honest, uh, and therefore trustworthy, and will follow the things that are laid out in their codes of ethics. And at this point, we usually ask our, our, our student, how many people have read the recent code of ethics of either here or of the AMA? Raise your hands. That's about right. That's just about what we find, and yet that is a public document, the public can read it, and that's what they expect you to follow. So, just as an aside, they uh, expect accountability, 
and openness, how we manage our affairs, and for a long time they didn't care, they now do. How do we self-regulate? Uh, how do we handle conflicts of interest? Uh, they expect us to become, be partners with them. It's no longer paternalistic. Uh, and they uh, want to, uh, they expect us to be a source of objective advice, especially in times of bioterrorism and epidemics and so forth. And the sociologists will tell you that there is no purpose for a, a profession unless it promotes the public good. So one should always look at actions in the way of does it promote the public good. Now on our side, this is a contract, what do we expect from our patients and the public? We expect to be trusted because we know that if we aren't trusted, that we cannot do for the patients the things that we need to. You can't do invasive procedures if somebody doesn't trust you with a knife. Uh, we need autonomy enough to be able to make decisions for the patient that best fit their needs. Doesn't mean you can do anything, anytime, anywhere, but it does mean that we have the freedom. Nobody, uh, there are guidelines, but we can apply them as they seem appropriate. We expect a role in public policy, and we've had some instances where the, our role has been ignored and some disasters have occurred. Uh, we expect the public and the individual patient to share some responsibility for their health. If their problems are related to obesity and they refuse to lose weight, if their problems are related to smoking and they refuse to stop, we expect them to help, let them help us um, we increasingly in the modern generation expect to maintain a reasonable lifestyle where we can have a reasonable family life and where we can follow some of our own hobbies and this sometimes interferes with altruism and we do expect rewards. And it's interesting in the polls that are taken of physicians that the main concerns they have are the non-financial ones, the question of trust, autonomy and that. Uh, but we also do expect to get paid. Now, if you look at uh, government's expectations of medicine and uh, reciprocal, uh, the, they're, these are very similar, so we'll go over them quickly. Assured competence, morality, integrity, and honesty. Compliance, we, they really do expect us to comply with the oh. details of the healthcare system. Uh, very strong emphasis on accountability for performance, productivity, and cost effectiveness. Uh, we certainly don't have to tell anybody in this room about that. They expect us to be transparent in how we uh, carry out our affairs. Uh, they expect team health care. Uh, they accept, expect us to be a source of objective advice. They certainly are free to uh, take or ignore that advice, as we've learned uh, the hard way. Uh, and they also expect us to be a force for good in society. We expect of government trust, autonomy, we expect to be able to self-regulate. That's been an important part of the contract. We're going to talk a little more about that. Uh, we expect a healthcare system that's value-laden, equitable, adequately funded and staffed, and with reasonable freedom within that uh, particular system. Uh, these things are, are actually very high on most physicians' lists. We expect a monopoly. Uh, we uh, have a long educational process. We believe uh, that we have skills which are, which can only be achieved in that way, and we do not think we should be competing with non-qualified people, and uh, we expect them to support us in term with non-financial and financial uh, words. And the word respect certainly comes in uh, in our dealings with our governments, and I'd be surprised if it wasn't true here. Now, the public also has expectations of government. And this is where it's interesting how closely they mi mimic some of ours. Uh, they do expect quality health care to be produced by whatever system the government has allowed to exist. Uh, but their health care system, they wish it to be accessible, to be fair, and to be value-laden. Sounds very familiar to ours. Adequately funded and staffed. Uh, more a problem north of the border than here. Uh, they expect input into health policy, and they feel disenfranchised in public policy the same way our profession does. Uh, so that I think they're our allies. They expect uh, the government to provide a system where there's a reasonable cost, that it's open in how it works, and to be accountable for what is put in place. Now, the government also expects the public to not demand inappropriate use of resources. 
uh, and to have reasonable expectations of whatever system is in place. Uh, they, again, expect the public to take some responsibility for their own health. They will try and uh, enforce the education that we try and give to, to patients on their things to do for better health, but they expect that people will take that advice. Uh, they expect uh, that there is support for whatever public policy comes out, uh, and they say that they want input into public policy and management, and I think sometimes take it. So, there are consequences when expectations are not met on either side. Uh, we've chosen to call them breaches of the contract. It doesn't matter what you, what you what descriptive term you do use. <laughs> Uh, what happens when we fail to meet reasonable societal expectations? Uh, certainly, if you look historically uh, in the, the recent past, you can say that there is a change in the contract. Uh, there's decreased public trust uh, in the system, uh, in the contract. Uh, trust in physicians and the, in the profession goes down. And we are, as a profession, much less trusted than we were uh, a generation ago. Uh, there is decreased medical influence on pe public policy. Uh, uh, we've seen that in Canada, you can see it in the UK, and I suspect it's been true here too. Uh, there will be diminished, if, if, uh, diminished self-regulation and an increase in external uh, regulation, and there will be changes in autonomy. Uh, and I think we can look in many countries and say that's true. Uh, the Harvard Business School case study, though, is in the UK uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, the Bristol cases and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Shipman's history. The Bristol cases uh, involve pediatric uh, uh, cardiac surgery on neonates uh, that was carried out in Bristol uh, with a mortality rate of seven, uh, six, five to six times the national average. The estimate is that uh, uh, between 60 and 70 babies died that would have lived if they had the normal mortality rate. It was due to the incompetence of the two surgeons carrying out the procedures. They weren't trained to do them. Uh, everybody knew, uh, the regional health authority, the department chairs, the Royal College uh, reviewed the program, noted the mortality rate, did nothing about it. Uh, and a new anesthetist came to town uh, from uh, London and uh, went through all the right steps uh, that you should go through. Uh, and finally went to the press, and you can imagine the response. We happened to be on sabbatic in Oxford at the time, and it, it was in the newspapers every single day forever. Uh, the result, uh, two, uh, royal commission, three royal commissions later, has been a profound change in the regulation of medicine in uh, the UK. By the way, other professions are, have had changes in their regulations as well. Uh, the General Medical Council uh, it works in the UK as the licensing body, but it also sets standards for education and training. Uh, it previously uh, was a body, much like our regulatory bodies, made up primarily of physicians uh, who were elected by the medical profession. Uh, as of now, the general med and, and there were a, a majority of the GMC uh, council were physicians. Uh, the current general medical council is appointed by the uh, Appointments Commission, which is a body that makes appointments across the board in the UK uh, for, in, on behalf of the government. Uh, less than half are physicians. The chairman is a non-physician. And they have hived discipline off from the General Medical Council to a separate body that carries out discipline in the healthcare professions. Again, totally appointed by the uh, government. Um, this. Uh, indicates that from a legal point of view, the medical profession in the UK is no longer self-regulating. It no longer controls the regulatory process because it doesn't have a majority other than GMC. Uh, the social contract has changed and the nature of professionalism in the UK has changed as a result of the failure to self-regulate by the medical profession, the failure to meet legitimate societal expectations. Now, we, we're frankly not being judgmental here. The system may well work well. The system may work well. Uh, it's only been, it's only a year and a half since it came into effect. Uh, but we will see. Certainly what we can say for sure is that in this instance, the failure of the medical profession to carry out its responsibilities within its jurisdiction, there has been a profound change in the social contract. Uh, and. Uh, 
And I think if you uh, look at uh, that, that's to a lesser degree, we're having changes in Canada. Uh, we are having the, the authority of the regulatory bodies limited by uh, the ability of ministers or governments to intervene and overrule them, something which did not exist uh, five years ago even. So what happens if society fails to meet our expectations? Uh, this is a little harder, and frankly, there is no literature on this. Uh, the literature on the Bristol cases and Shipman is extensive, and it does uh, interpret events the way we have described them, as a failure of, of the medical profession. Uh, there isn't much uh, on what happens when there isn't anything what, what happens on uh, when society fails to meet our expectations. You can imply that when you go into the literature on physician discontent or, or physicians' opinions on healthcare systems. Uh, and uh, we've sort of gotten to the point where we think that the, uh, we are all suffering from a collective bipolar disorder. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, when we look at our response where we've had ups and downs in the implementation of our healthcare system, that we vary between optimism and pessimism depending on what's happened during the last hours, days, or months, or so forth. Uh, if things, uh, if, if our expectations are not being met, and uh, by the way, we can talk about the Canadian healthcare system and where we feel that society has, uh, has failed us a little bit if we want. Uh, there's less trust in the system or the contract. Uh, there's less cooperative uh, cooperation. Uh, we withdraw. We, uh, we don't serve on committees. We, uh, we, uh, we look upon our work as a job rather than a calling, and certainly there's less satisfaction. On the other hand, if all of a sudden there's been a change in ministerial policy or things are looking like they might improve, uh, then you get increased involvement uh, in your community, with your associations, with other stakeholders. Uh, you tend to get involved in negotiating to make the system better, and we believe that there's more job satisfaction. Uh, we can't sort of point to seminal articles that would justify this, but I do think that, that, that it is true. So. Uh, where are we? Well, in the United States, uh, you have a market-oriented system that absolutely uh, forces physicians to become entrepreneurs within a competitive marketplace. You, you just have to to survive. Maybe not in academic med medical centers, but in the community. Uh, there is competition. This, the system is based upon competition, and there's diminished collegiality. Uh, we tried to recruit a, an orthopedic surgeon back to Canada who had a degree in medical education and a, quite a track record. She was in a, in a cooperative practice and she uh, said that she really couldn't be away too long because she was afraid that when she got back that her, that her so-called colleagues would, uh, that her patients would be gone. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's not a happy situation. Uh, that's a personal anecdote. Uh, un the uninsured provide a, a, a huge moral dilemma for, for everybody. Uh, and, and there's no real answer to that. The increased accountability uh, has certainly been a cause of dissatisfaction and has led to decreased clinical autonomy. So is there a major change in the contract? Certainly there's a major contract change in the contract uh, in, in this country uh, since I graduated from medical school in 1955. Uh, this, is, this is a totally different deal. The contract is different and, uh, and so is the nature of professionalism. And there's decreased trust in the system and, and I guess uncertainty as to what the future will hold for the practice of medicine. Uh, Canada, a little bit different. Uh, we, have, we suffer primarily from decreased funding in our system. Uh, in 1990, we uh, had the second highest per capita, per capita uh, no, uh, highest debt uh, per GDP, as a percentage of GDP in the OECD. Italy was the only one that was ahead of us. Uh, the big items in Canada are health and education, and uh, Willie Sutton robbed banks because that was where the money was, and budget. And when people want to have major budget cuts, they got to go where the money is. So health and education got cut. We went from the most performing uh, healthcare system according to OECD to number 13 uh, because of those cuts, uh, and uh, it has had a profound impact on the practice of medicine. Uh, as a part of those cuts, they cut down on the number of healthcare personnel, including doctors, so we don't have enough. Uh, there's less personal freedom in an attempt to uh, uh, ensure regional disparity. 
uh, our overcome. province uh, not to, to ensure it. Uh, to, not to ensure it, yeah. uh, uh, to address regional disparity between rural areas and cities. Uh, our Quebec government limits access to practice in cities. You can't build a healthcare system unless you have permission. So there's much less freedom within the system. Uh, it's a major change in the contract, and these changes have occurred in the last 15 years. Uh, breach, uh, probably, uh, and certainly uh, our, our physicians have less trust in the system. So if our expectations uh, aren't met, uh, and society, by the way, as we'll say again, uh, has most of the cards in these negotiations, uh, there are consequences. So what should we do? Uh, we're going to have to lear learn to live with the changes. Uh, they're here to stay. They're really linked to how society has changed, and so uh, we can't ignore them. We have to do something, and the first thing we need to do is to address the issues that are in our own control. Uh, and we've got to negotiate those that aren't in our control, which is basically to negotiate some sort of a healthcare system that supports the healer role. So what issues can we control and should we get at? Well, the first is to ensure that all physicians understand their obligations to society and society's expectations. What are, the, what, is their, what are their obligations as professionals in, in the health care? Teach professionalism to the social, and the social contract, the concept of the social contract, to medical students, residents, faculty, and in continuing medical education. Uh, because if you don't understand what the relation is, and it's interesting that the concept of the social contract in face of today's health care system Feel, the students feel empowered by it because they feel they have a way to, into negotiating. Um, but we also have to address what our failures are. The perceived lack of altruism, the fact that there is a, a lot of attention paid to how much money is being paid to physicians. There's a lot of, of, of attention paid to lifestyle and, some, uh, and the short duty hours, the question of what is the responsibility to the patient, the patient uh, who, who's, uh, who's, who's, whose well-being comes first out of the patient or not? We're going to have to deal with that problem. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with the conflicts of interest. Are you doing this for me because you make more money out of it? Or are you doing this because that's really what's needed? And we also, less here, but uh, we have to look at our associations, our collective. Uh, and their union-like activities. And I think uh, even the AMA is, has been guilty of some uh, corporate and union-like activities, not necessarily in the best interests of society. So have all of our associations. I'm not damning them in particular. Uh, and there have been some very badly managed conflicts of interest, which the media is delighted to talk about. And we'll have to be very careful. Uh, to manage them better and to be very transparent in our relations with the health, other healthcare industries. Uh, we'll have to be better in self-regulation. We are our brothers and our sisters keepers. We cannot allow incompetent, immoral, uh, unethical practitioners to continue without remediation and be followed. And we'll have to we have the knowledge of how resources should be uh, distributed, so we're going to have to pay attention to how resources are distributed to social justice. So what should we do? Well, Sylvia's talked about what we do for, for those things under our jurisdiction. Somehow or other, we've got to address the external stresses. Uh, that requires a single or voice or a coordinated voice speaking for medicine. Um, I think you, you have multiple voices speaking for you here. We do too. Uh, however, our, our constitution gives health care to the provinces as a responsibility. And at the provincial level, we are universally re represented by our provincial associations, which are legal unions under the law. Uh, I think you have some difficulty <coughs> in deciding who's actually going to represent you, the AMA or your provincial or your associations. It also takes a negotiating table. Uh, when you have a National Health Service, there is a negotiating table, uh, and it's easier. That's, again, a difficulty uh, that we could spend a lot of time on in this country. We've got to recognize that we are not the only ones at the table. 
Uh, we're no, and in fact, we're probably not the dominant players that Elliot Friedson correctly described during uh, uh, his lifetime. Uh, but we certainly have to be at the table. So we would suggest that negotiations must establish or preserve trust, satisfy both sides. They're not symmetrical. Society has most of the cards, uh, and it's a very difficult. However, we are not without uh, a very, very important card. Uh, every single citizen needs, the ser will, needs or will need the services of the healer. Uh, and uh, the healer remains trusted and respected. And we, we actually do believe that if we act in a professional way in the negotiations that we actually uh, have the, the power to influence those negotiations. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, the public and medicine, as we tried to point out with those three slides of expectations, actually have very similar desires in healthcare, and uh, uh, it would seem it seems logical to to invoke public support uh, in in our attempt to, to get a system which actually supports the healer. So, in summary. Uh, our professionalism is certainly under threat, as we said earlier. I think that's the reason why there are so many people in this room. Uh, preserving professionalism isn't just important to us, it's also important to society. Uh, and uh, professionalism does serve as the basis of our social contract, and invoking this concept uh, does provide a basis for discourse and a rationale for our obligations. Uh, and we think it's therefore logical. What we're dealing with is not inconsequential to society. Uh, Vaclav Havel, uh, who's certainly one of the great statements, statesmen of modern times, says that since time immemorial, a part of human culture has been man's care for himself. Uh, I think if it had been translated, he might have said herself. But uh, <laughs> for the body in which the spirit resides, that is for his own health, the culture of healing may be a less visible aspect of life, yet it's perhaps the most important indicator of the humanity of any society. Those are the issues we're dealing with. And we hope we have, uh, according to your motto, uh, added to the knowledge base and that perhaps uh, some, good, uh, some will, good, will good will come out of it. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. Remember, this is only a recording mic, so please speak loudly. I'll, I'll take the privilege of the first question. Um, so thank you for that wonderful talk. You said, you made a comment that we cannot negotiate like the auto workers. And I guess I'm going to ask why, and since we're looking at it internationally, in France, um, doctors like in Canada are unionized. And in France, they've actually had multiple strikes. So have where, we. So have we. Okay. Um, and so what makes us different than the auto workers? And how do we deal with strikes and then still call ourselves professionals and the obligations we have? Well, one of the things, maybe I'll give an example, uh, two examples from Canada, but the Ontario uh, obstetrics and gynecologist, OBGYN, uh, refused to deliver, take on new patients because they wanted a lot more money. And it was quite clear in the media that they were striking for money. Uh, and they were badly tarnished by it. Uh, and they, uh, they lost. In New Brunswick, the general practitioners were earning about two-thirds or half of what all the other people in Canada in the same practice were doing. And they went on strike because they couldn't recruit anybody in and people were leaving. And the message they gave to the public was that we need more doctors. We can't get them with the current pay rate. Help us. And the public bought it. And the government gave in. So it depends on what, whether you're striking for yourself and appearing to, or whether you're striking for the public good. But how, how is that different than the auto workers? Well, the auto workers <laughs> can totally withdraw services. We cannot. And, and we can't. Uh, and in fact, uh, you haven't had problems with strikes down here. No. You, you aren't organized. In fact, there are legal difficulties in actually creating doctors' unions, I believe. Uh, but. In most areas where, uh, where doctors uh, where have the potential to strike, uh, they are classified as an essential service and, and are prevented from taking classical strikes where you totally withdraw services. 
Uh, so that's why we, uh, one of the reasons why we say that it isn't, uh, you, you can't use the same tactics. Uh, where, where we use tactics which sound like they are very self-serving, we lose public support. And uh, for the medical profession to exert any influence on government, they absolutely have to have public support. The Ontario doctor strike in 1986 that Sylvia talked about was, was, was catastrophic for physicians, not just in Ontario, but all across the country. Uh, the medical profession was a, uh, remains the highest paid single uh, <laughs> occupational group in the country. Uh, the, 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 the press knows that. The public does not that. understand. The pub public doesn't think we're, we're badly done by. Uh, and, but they will support us if it looks as if, the, as if we're being treated unfairly. I have some worries about the use of the idea of a social contract. And I understand you're using it loosely. Um, but still, the way you've set it up, it's a contract between something called medicine or the medical profession and something called society. And with contracts, there are bilateral obligations of various kinds. But as in what you're talking about breach, what usually that means is that if one party breaches, the other has um, lower obligations. Some things which would have been an obligation in the absence of breach now are no longer obligations. And what I worry about is that really the primary obligation of a physician is not to society in some very general abstract sense, but to particular patients. And so the metaphor of the contract suggests that if a thing called society breaches, the physician's obligations to what decrease? You don't want, I take it, to say to the patient's decreases, but it looks as if that might follow from this particular metaphor. And so that's why I'm wondering if the metaphor captures adequately the complexity of the physician situation that seems to go in the one direction towards institutions, society as a whole, but in another direction towards particular patients. Yeah, that's a, a very... Uh, that's the dilemma. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> it's a, a defect in the metaphor, if you will. The, the other very strong defect is that when we were a non-secular society, we could ground our relationship both with patients and society and morality. Uh, and we've, this draws it away from a moral obligation to behave in a certain way. Uh, and those two defects, I, I think, are, are, are very real. Why don't you want to go back to this idea of a moral obligation? That is, that there is the capacity, a distinct capacity, that the physician has to provide a benefit. Precisely as you say, through training and opportunity and so forth, this is a capacity to provide a benefit that no one else has. Why doesn't that itself generate at least some prima facie obligation? Well, two answers to that. In the, in the first place, uh, we, we don't go away from it, but, but I, I'm saying that it's, a, it's, it, 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 it's apparent. Secondly, we're not sh sure how far morality is accepted by the current generation of, of students, <laughs> trainees, younger physicians. Uh, we don't know whether, uh, whether that's actually how powerful that remains. Uh, you, people in the room are going to have to answer that for us. Uh, we're from a different generation, but our, our observation is that, that this idea of reciprocal rights and obligations is more acceptable to the current uh, generation, and I put that, that level up to people that certainly into their 40s. And I don't know whether people agree with that or not. But I think, it, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a fiduciary duty and a moral obligation to your individual patients. And I think that when strikes have occurred, at least in our, uh, those needs have always been met. There have always been emergency service. There has not been lack of contact with the patient uh, should the need arise. It's just that the elective things are sort of put off. Not, uh, but I think we're playing games. It, it, and, and I think the dilemma remains. Oh, thank you for, for a wonderful talk. So I particularly uh, think it's very useful to think about as you've broken down the healer role and the professional role. And you both spoke about the healer role may be a universal across cultures or 
across societies. So I wanted you to comment on, on the idea that maybe that's not quite true, and maybe there are people, the healer role as defined by naturopaths or other systems of care, which while in our Western context, there might be the minority of where people get their healing from, but in the other societies, that might be the majority, that they go to these other entities who can claim that healing role, but yet don't have the professional role or regulation that the state might want through the social contract, right? So, so and even the rise of such systems, even within societies like ours, in certain states and certain types of education, do you read that as now as a, a, as, as a result of distrust and because of this over-regulation? How do, you, how do you make sense of these sorts of phenomena? Well, I think uh, most people, and I think we would agree, feel that when individuals go to alternative uh, practitioners, that it represents a failure on the part of the medical profession that we somehow have not been able to satisfy their demands. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the nature of the question. Uh, so in the sense that you can claim a healing role? Yeah. Without, right? So if you're an, uh, an naturopathic... Well, we do not have a monopoly over healer, over the healer, oh, okay. healing role. I want to make that absolutely okay. clear. I mean... Uh, uh, so, so, so but we have a monopoly over our knowledge base and our skills yeah, and, and that we have been trained. Nobody else can use those, yeah. if you will. So, so that's why I was wanting clarification. Because yeah. you can say, even aside from naturopaths, you can talk about healing through you know, chaplains or other things. So I want to get a sense of where this breaks down. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, we, and and our, uh, the, the law actually outlines the nature of our monopoly and what we are legally uh, entitled, to. En entitled to, if you will. Uh, considering that you touched on several very important themes, one of which is that um, people feel a calling to be physicians, mm -hmm. and then also that we have an expectation, especially in these modern times, that we are also going to be able to have a life outside of the hospital. And so my particular question is, um, with the new hours restrictions for residents, especially here, um, how do you see going forward that professionalism um, can be a part of training without it being uh, like a didactic session about professionalism? How can we have people become professionals and be dedicated to the profession if they're so restricted in their hours? I think one of the biggest problems that, that residents face and short hours and so forth face is in ensuring continuity of care ensuring the patient's feeling that there is presence, that I know what's coming next, I know who's going to provide it, and I know that the person who's going to provide it knows me or knows about me and knows enough, not just a bunch of numbers. Uh, and I think that we have not trained very well on that, and I think we're going to have to spend much more attention on how one ensures the continuity of care, whether it's called transitions or whatever, it is, but uh, the, that the patient, the healer needs to provide presence, and you've got to do the presence uh, if, if it isn't you. You've got to make sure that the person to whom you are handing it off will provide that. We, uh, our first or second workshop that we gave at McGill, mm -hmm. uh, a first year resident in family medicine came up to us and very nicely said that your generation must not use professionalism as a means of imposing its lifestyle on my generation. And our immediate response uh, was a short four-letter word like, what do we do now? Uh, and, uh, and, it's, and it's real, uh, and, and, that, and it's a real issue. We actually uh, have come to, and, and, and by the way, uh, it's justified. I mean, we're, not, mm -hmm. we're not saying that our generation uh, should, that this should happen. What we are telling our students and residents, and presumably I'm telling you, is that this is your generation's obligation to work out a means whereby your patients remain satisfied with what they think is your commitment to them. And you are able to have a satisfactory lifestyle. And it's going to have to be, as Sylvia says, it's going to have to imply working together to a much greater degree so that patients' or need, needs are satisfied by more than one individual. Uh, but if the general public and individual patients become convinced that uh, we work nine to five and that their needs uh, are, are not going to be met after five, uh, then the nature of the relationship between 
your, your, you and your patient, and between us and society will change profoundly. And, it and will be we can't do it for you guys. Yeah. Uh, you have to, this is something you have to work out on your own, but you have to understand the consequences of a, an unsatisfied, that's where these reciprocal rights and obligation actually do come in, that there will be consequences if, if the public and individual patients remain dissatisfied with our response. So for those who are still here, if you could join me in a warm thank you to the Croices, and I'm sure they'll... <laughs> And for those who are able and want to continue the conversation, I'm going to let the choices sit and they can continue the conversation right. in that way. Thank you again.